Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. My name is Paul John Dykes. Today, I'm joined by Kevin Graham. Hello there. And JP Mason. JP, welcome to the show. Hello, pleasure to be here. Now, a Celtic State of Mind tries to uh, get into your mindset in terms of Celtic. And I see here that you're wearing one of the, the most controversial Celtic away strips uh, in history. Could you tell us a wee bit about that and what that means to you? Um, well, this is... Uh, I can't claim that this was... The, the top I had when I was a wee guy I did have this top but it, it, it perished at some point um, so I, I, I repurchased this off eBay about maybe about 8 or 10 years ago or something like that but I've, I thought it was in great condition so I gave it an airing today but it's the, the, the so called according to Google chocolate Celtic away top from right. the season well, I don't know, really know how that's chocolate but it's from the Cascarino season yeah 91-92 and uh, I guess yeah just represents the the dark times of being a Celtic fan and uh, growing up in Bathgate and yeah um, not really seeing any success at all from from Celtic Park throughout that time and it was just um, yeah it was quite a hard time to be a Celtic fan you know I, I picked my team in 88 um, as a result of the watching the Scottish Cup final with my dad and just I remember watching it on the TV just a Saturday afternoon and the sunshine sunshine outside and and McAvenny scored those two goals and I just completely and utterly fell in love with Frank McAvenny in that moment. Um and you know, platonically I might add. Um but uh yeah, the the goals were amazing and then the atmosphere and just, just seeing the dust getting kicked up at, at Hamden and and just that it just looked like some some sort of I don't know. Fairy tale. Yeah, it was. It was a complete fairy tale. It was completely it was like someone had written a script mm-hmm. and they'd followed it. Mm-hmm. Or a like a movie scene or something. And uh, I begged my dad to take me to a game. I was like, I want to see these guys play. When we, they, they're just along the road, you know. Like I was only half an hour away in a car, so he took me to a game at Celtic Park in September '88. So it was the season after, and uh, I brought my program with me. It's just down there against Hamilton Academicals, um, and Paul McStay's on the cover. Uh, and uh, yeah, those, those, I mean, great, great memories of being at the game. It wasn't. It wasn't sold out. It wasn't the Celtic Park that we know and love nowadays. Remember the old uh, sort of the bars that you you went on. I went up at half time to get a, a, a cup of juice, and I came back, and the game had started, and I was rushing back to my dad to get back to the, to being with him to watch the game. And I was just I was watching the game and not watching where I was going, and I crashed my head right into <laughs> one of those green barriers. <laughs> and guys came over and they were like, "You're right, wee man," and they sorted me out and. Yeah, that was my introduction to Celtic. It's, it's quite interesting because um, a lot of fans, like myself, it's been passed down maybe from generation to generation and it's difficult to actually remember an introduction. But you, you've you chosen, this is my team and I want to go and see them. Yeah, it was, It was. I mean, I, I was born in, in Manchester. Um, my dad's uh, from Bradford, my mum's from Falkirk, but they met in Linlithgow and then they, they grew up, uh, they sort of, they... Uh, my mum was teaching down in, in Manchester and my dad worked in Manchester and uh, she went down uh, to get a job in Manchester and then so the first four years of my life was Manchester and then we moved up to uh, Falkirk initially and then Bathgate and the school I went to St Mary's primary school everyone in my class was, was Celtic fans you know there was it, it was kind of one of those things where you're just like all oh, right you're, you're a Celtic fan you're a Celtic fan and football stickers and all that kind of thing and then yeah I, I, I made a a conscious decision to commit to Celtic. I didn't realise at that point that it would be ten years before <laughs> Celtic would win the league again. You know, like or, or even enjoy the success that they they had in that in that season when we won the double. And people have called me a glory hunter because I, I supported a team that won the two trophies. But uh, the, those ten years were horrendous. Well, not horrendous, but they were they, they weren't exactly enjoyable. Do you know what I mean? That so. was a grim period. We had. Frank McAvenny in here uh, a couple of months ago and we were talking about the Scottish Cup final and I always remember in the crowd seeing I think it was four or five guys dressed as clowns and they were, <laughs> it was beautiful sunshine and it must have been really warm and Marco told us they were actual they were Celtic players they were squad players it was like Stevie Murray Stevie Murray and he, sta- he named them all Stevie Keane I think one of them as well who ended up down at Blackburn I think so, as a right? manager they were Celtic players and they were in the crowd dressed as clowns <laughs> <laughs> so all else started to make sense. So we went on a, a really dismal run mm-hmm. where obviously Rangers won nine in a row. What's your memories of that? Were you as proud to wear this shirt in 1991 uh, as you are now? Uh, absolutely, although I wasn't kind of allowed to wear it. My mum was 
very against me wearing a Celtic strip out and about in Bathgate and I w- if I was going to wear it I'd have to sneak out of the house wearing it because back then in Bathgate wearing a Celtic top you know you didn't get it easy it was predominantly Rangers in, in Bathgate and all the surrounding towns your Armadales your Whitburns mm-hmm. and all that it was all you know the bands in season and all that kind of stuff so it, you just, it was not wise to wear it out and the few times that I did I remember just getting Abuse, like so much abuse, got spat at in the park, you know, just playing football with my pals and got spat at by kind of older kids wearing Rangers tops. Remember the one, the Adidas equipment one and stuff like that, you know, the that sort of 93, 94 <laughs> season. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was just, it was difficult. And I would go on the, on the bus from Bathgate with my mate John Green and his big sister Tracy and they would, we would go to Celtic Park in the sort of mid 90s or 93, 94, 95. Um, and yeah, I remember seeing Stuart Slater make his debut, and like it was a Wednesday night, I think. And I remember thinking he's going to be the, the best player ever. We've paid like a million quid for this guy, and he wasn't. He? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with the greatest of respect to him, but uh, you know, just those 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 times in the nineties. Yeah, I mean, I was friends with a lot of Rangers fans, and we used to. I used to watch. If I wasn't fortunate enough to get tickets for those games, because it was hard if you weren't a season ticket holder, I would go to my mate Colin's house and there would be Colin, Paul, both staunch Rangers fans, and I would be watching the game. And it would be a couple other Celtic fans as well, and we'd watch the games, and it was just like every single time you're just like, oh my God, when are we going to win one of these games? We'd win the odd one, but we'd never win the ones that mattered. We'd win the ones that were just like. It's a, it's a continual boot in the stomach, eh? Yeah. When you think that you've. Turned the corner when oh. it come to a game that mattered, oh. you, you would lose it. I remember ninety four, ninety five, the Hamden season, one and three nothing. Rudy Vatter scoring a, a, a peachy free kick. Mm-hmm. Can I call it a peachy free kick? I, I think, think you it, can. Nah, nah. Yeah. Earlier on, you had the uh, St Patrick's Day massacre, <laughs> and then beating them the, the the week after as well. Tommy Coyne scored against him as well in the Scot- Scottish Cup. Tonight. That's when Butcher booted the door when McNeil was getting interviewed mm-hmm. after the and game. And John Brown booted Tommy Coyne yeah. in the back of the net as well. <laughs> um, I, you're right. Any time when you thought that when we all thought that we were turning the corner, we got that boot. Oh, the, the Eric Bo Anderson game. That oh. was honestly one of the worst moments I've ever had in my life. And I was in the hole in the wall in Linlithgow watching it with my pal Tam Wilson, who now lives in Australia. And when Bo Anderson scored that goal, a guy jumped, the TV was up in the corner, and a guy jumped up and actually headbutted the TV. Like, I've never, I've, I was, the guy was, I'm, this is completely true, I watched that happen, and I just saw him fall down and, like, lay in the ground in front of the TV, and I was like, that's how rubbish this moment is, mm-hmm. that's how horrendous this moment is, like, it was just, I was not, <laughs> if we'd have lost the 10, oh my God, I, I I can't even begin to imagine how grim that would have been. One of the worst ones was, you mentioned Stoughton the 10, was a couple of weeks before it, and we got beat at Ibrox. Uh, I think Alberts and Jonas, Jonas Tern, Tern. Mm-hmm. scored. I remember, I didn't have a ticket for that game, and I remember storming out my cousin's house, yeah. up the road, gone. this is not going to happen. Nah, I've got a good one about that. The weekend of the Dunfermline game, I couldn't get a ticket as many people couldn't get a ticket for that East End Park game I mean they were gold dust going for silly money and all that kind of nonsense but my mate Adam uh, from uni I was just in my first year of uni and uh, he was a Kilmarnock fan Kilmarnock daft and he just said uh, he was like you going to the game on Sunday and I was like nah I can't get a ticket he went do you want to come to the Ibrox with me and my dad uh, Kilmarnock Rangers at Ibrox and I was like aye why not I, I, I was so obsessed with football still am I was like I'll, just, I'll come with you it'll be a good laugh so I went to the game and uh, <laughs> obviously I'm, I've got you know um, other interests than the Kilmarnock fans and I think it was Ali Mitchell mm-hmm. scored in the, in the 87th minute or something to win the game for them which meant that if we won the next day against Dunfermline we won the league and I went I mean the Kilmarnock fans were going wild I was going completely <laughs> tonto in the away end at Ibrox right and then Adam and his dad left and I stayed and I watched all the Rangers players come out with their kids and they were all crying and all that because it was the end of an era the end of the Walter Smith era it was like Durant and all that and I was just like <laughs> yes drink it in drink it in and they, they were all like just like waving at the fans all kind of like oh no we've completely mucked this up we're not going to win 10 in a row and I was just like damn right yeah and then I was like oh no I need to leave here and not be happy when I'm walking through 
So I remember walking through Rangers fans and being like, right, I need to pretend I'm raging. So I was like kicking cans and all that. <laughs> I totally remember that. That's mental. I've not thought about that for a while. Bobby Tate's last game. It was, uh-huh. And they played it and played it and played it, hoping that Rangers would win. Uh, I'm guessing, uh, obviously. No. Nah. Kilmarnock scored, as you say, I think it was six or seven minutes into injury time. Yeah, it was right at the death and it was like, wow, I can't believe this is actually happening. And then the next day... I was watching the game with my dad in Turficken, which is a little village just outside Bathgate. And, you know, we were winning 1-0. And I knew there was going to be a big party if, if we won. I went and got my jacket and sitting on the couch. And my dad was like, I'll run you through to the Gallagate. I know it's going to be mental. And I was sitting there with my jacket on and I cursed it because I put my jacket on. And then the next thing, Falconbridge. I was like, oh. We God. all remember that name. <laughs> I spoke to him that night in Lorenzo's in Dunfermline. Did you? <laughs> he was on loan from Coventry City. Yeah, yeah, he was a big, massive guy. And he just stuck a head in it. It wasn't even... I wouldn't even say it was a deft header. It he was had just, no idea what he'd done. No. No, no idea. But in terms of the what he'd done, the impact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He still I, plays, non-league. Really? Mm-hmm. That's insane. That's like 20 was, years ago. 38, 39. No way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, like, he was that young when he was at Dunfermline. Yeah. Wow. I, I was in the Dunfermline in that day. And I always remember trying to get into the Dunfermline end. Mm-hmm. I had a ticket. Uh, one of the local buses, a Paul McStay, got, got me a ticket. And uh, it was a policeman for Stirling that was standing at the turnstile. And he went, what are you doing? And I went, I'm going into the football. He went, no, you're not. So wow. he said, knocked me back. He says, I can that you're not a Dunfermline fan. So I just went up and went to another turnstile. And <laughs> <laughs> just went in there. But, um, but uh, no, aye, that was a... We had big parties in that plan that night. Oh, they all went to, to pot. And then the following week, oh man, I was ill. I had like I had like some sort of septic throat. Like it was so painful and I was really, really ill and I couldn't go to the game. I couldn't I, I couldn't go to Celtic Park that day and I had to give up my ticket. And I mean, Michael was phoning me going, oh, just come, just get a pint and you'll be fine. I was like, Michael, I can barely speak. I couldn't eat anything. Uh, it was horrendous and I was listening to the game on the radio in my bed it was like I couldn't believe that after all that time waiting to win the league I I was you know bedridden Uh, another uh, aspect of today's uh, podcast you'll see that Kevin and I are very much into our music as much as uh, as the football could you tell us a wee bit about your own experiences of getting involved in writing about music booking bands and getting involved with with managing bands well uh, I kind of I went to uni and didn't really my, my my degree didn't really do anything for me. It still doesn't really do anything for me other than give me very nice memories of living in the south of France for six months as a as an exchange. Uh, that was great. I actually flew back to see Celtic when the the first trophy I ever saw Celtic lift was in two thousand under Doug Leash in the League Cup Vida Reset against Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. I fl- I'd just been living in Nice for maybe a month or so and then I booked a flight to come back for the weekend for the League Cup final and that was my first uh, first trophy I ever saw as lift because I'd never we'd never won a trophy <laughs> like in all that time I couldn't I got I was at the Wraith Rovers Coca-Cola Cup final with my dad we know what happened there I couldn't get a ticket for the Erdry game and then I couldn't get a ticket for uh, the League Cup final in 97 um, and then there was no, not really a, a, that great many opportunities after that so 2000 was the first but I went to uni, uh, you know, got my degree and then, you know, had a couple of jobs after that, worked in a bank and as I was working at the bank, I, st- I started going to like loads and loads of gigs in Edinburgh at just, Edinburgh back then still had loads of it's music venues, music, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't anymore, It's, uh, it's they've all fallen by the wayside, either been shut down by the council or burnt down or just, you know, noise it's complaints. It's extremely poor Edinburgh now, eh? That's mental. When they got rid of the picture house. Oh no, that was a blow. That was a big blow. Just like the ABC going recently in Glasgow, Mm -hmm. a venue that size, when you take that out of the the gig ladder, it just it leaves a massive chasm between, you know, a a five hundred, six hundred to then go to the corn exchange, the corn exchange or the academy. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing in between. Even the Barrowland's quite a big place to jump up to. It's nineteen hundred. You know, so. yeah, so I started going to loads of gigs, and then was an ex-girlfriend of mine said, "You know, you should you should probably write reviews. You know, I think you'd be really good at writing." And I was buying this magazine called "Is This Music," 
um, that was just a guy in Linlithgow who produced this magazine called This That's Music and he would release it every two months with a CD on the top with new up and coming bands and uh, I was buying that magazine and I just I just emailed him one day and went listen I, I was thinking about writing a review you know would you, would you be up for reading it and he went send, send me a review so I went to a gig in the reading rooms in Dundee to see a band called The Soho Dolls and they were a, a band championed by Alan McGee at the time They've since done nothing. <laughs> but uh, I went to see them that night and uh, re- reviewed the gig, sent it to Stuart, and then he published it. And uh, the next thing I was like reading the magazine that I'd been reading, the following issue, I was reading my review in this issue, and I was like, this is... what? How has this happened? You know, I mean, it was, it's not exactly, you know, um, Time magazine or Q or anything like that, but it was, for me that was a big deal, getting something published. And then... Established a good relationship with him, uh, wrote more reviews, and then I came across a band on the lists of bands that he sent. One of the bands he sent over was Frightened Rabbit, and I listened to them, and I was just like, there's something really special about them. And I went through to to Glasgow to the Arlington Bar, May 2006, uh, and went to see them play this little tiny wee pub. It's nothing special at all. Um, but they were playing there for some reason. I think Scott just liked that pub, and I'd never met him before. I'd communicated with him through MySpace, and we became friends after that. And he said, "I really hope this isn't the last time you come to one of our gigs." And it wasn't. And I, I went to all their gigs after that, everywhere they played. And then he introduced me to the Twilight Sad. Um, in two thousand and seven, he took me to see them. He said, "They're the only band in Scotland that are better than us." <laughs> That's what he said. And uh, he took us to see them at the Classic Grand. They were supporting a guy called David Paho from Slint. Slint, aye. Yeah. So it was at the uh, the Triptych Festival that used to be. That's, that's right, aye. Yeah, it was a really aye. good festival. It used to bring great people from all over the world, really, and artists, you know, Einster's End and Neubarton, and, you uh-huh. know, like Grace Jones played the Corn Exchange as part of Triptych, I think, as well. and um, so yeah, they, they were they were playing supporting David Paho. He introduced me to James, and then James and I became friends. And it was like myself, James, and Scott just were really. I, I was like this wee sort of wide-eyed fanboy of these two guys who became my friends. But they were also the singer in bands that were starting to make waves. And and then I just got to just got to know them at that right at that time. You know, just at that time where they were just taking off. But I saw them going through some hard times, much like Celtic, you know, playing to no one, you know, not getting recognised, not getting um, other people getting record deals and they're not getting record deals and you'd see other bands in Glasgow getting a game, Las Vegas, I'm I'm friends with Las Vegas and I'm a fan of them, but, you know, I was like, Las Vegas are doing this and Frank Rabbit and the Twilight Sad Mm -hmm. aren't getting this recognition and people are then saying, oh, the Twilight Sad sound a bit like Las Vegas and it's like, well, no, actually... They came before, um, and that sound was there already. So, um, yeah, and then from that, I ended up um, putting on gigs, and I put on a gig, um, I put on a John Peel tribute night at the Wee Red Bar in Edinburgh. Uh, That was 2006, I think, or no, 2005. It was on the first anniversary of John Peel's passing, and that was just with a bunch of bands from Edinburgh and Glasgow. And then... uh, I put on Frightened Rabbit at Leith Dockers Club in 2007. That was before Frightened Rabbit had released their album that everyone loves, Midnight Organ Fight. No one really knew who they were. I just pestered everybody at the bank where I worked and said, come see this band. You know, you'll you'll really be into them. I I, I can promise you, if you like things like Idlewild and Snow Patrol and all that kind of stuff, you'll be into Frightened Rabbit. And loads of those people then became fans then and we were all always going to see them all the way mm-hmm. through, like up until Barrowland and everything, and they were all at that show. And then uh, I guess I just did a bunch of other stuff. I did a radio show in, in, for Leith FM in Edinburgh as well for like four years, every Sunday, two hours doing this, speaking into one of these, <laughs> um, playing all new Scottish bands and other bands that I'd got into, and I had those people in as guests. I've got a two-hour... I'm so glad I've recorded some of it. I mean, you guys have obviously got all this recorded forever but I mean a lot of the stuff I did is just oh. lost to the to the ether I mean like you know they didn't they weren't very good at their archiving um, but I managed to get some stuff and I've got a two hour Christmas special that I did with Scott um, with just us playing uh, Christmas songs and talking nonsense it's, and I've, I've got that and I'll, I'll I'll make it public at probably round about December time just because 
uh, well, I, think, I mean, I want people to hear it. Just, I mean, people did hear it at the time, but not very, not very many. But you consider 10, 11 years later how many people would be interested in hearing it now. So, um, so yeah, and then a, a job became available at a local venue in Edinburgh called the Electric Circus. No and longer here, are you? No longer here, no. And I, I was DJing there already anyway. And then I just said, look, I can, I can do this job. I can book bands and put on gigs. And the next thing... I got that job and I was leaving HSBC after, what, seven years of working there. And it was really scary to take that leap and move away from something that I was doing and that was financially all right in HSBC, but I knew that I wanted to do that and I, and I just threw myself into it. And for three years, 2011 to 2014, was just, you know, gig, 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 working in the office during the day, gig at night, working through the office. And, like, I got to meet so many mad folk like on their way up you know and people that were already established um, like Howard Marks we put on Howard Marks one night and like <laughs> it was like completely surreal having Howard Marks in the venue and just chatting with, him, with John Sinclair as well who John Lennon wrote the song Breathe in Air for John Sinclair um, when he was when he was incarcerated for um, possession of marijuana like so I things like that were amazing and I called in favours from all the bands that I'd become friends with like Frightened Rabbit Twilight Sad uh, the Jetpacks and a bunch of other bands and and yeah and I kind of always wanted to work in Glasgow and then DF came calling and they were kind of the only <laughs> Mo Johnson line the only company I wanted to work for <laughs> um, Mo Johnson gets mentioned far too many <laughs> times on this podcast it says something about uh, the psychological st- scars that we've got oh my god I, I can briefly touch on that as well I remember <laughs> that day he signed because he'd scored for Scotland, he'd scored an overhead kick against France, France. not long before that. And, and anybody that scored an overhead kick for me was just like some sort of superhero. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was like how do you, how can you do that? How, I mean, I have scored a couple at fives <laughs> <laughs> in my time, but um, that that honestly that goal, and I was like, oh my god, he's coming to Celtic. That's this is going to be amazing. We've got that guy that can score an overhead kick. And then I remember my mate Stephen Brown in this the playground at St Mary's Primary had a newspaper and it was quite weird to see like a wee guy at like whatever age he was nine like with a newspaper because it's just it's not really the sort of thing you expect a wee guy at that age to carry around and on the back page it had the picture of him in the ranger strip and I was like because obviously before internet and all that I was like what well, how is he signing for rangers why is he why is he not what because I'd seen we'd seen him in the Celtic talk with Billy McNeil mm-hmm. And uh, and he was like, oh no, he's he's going he's going to Rangers. I remember the the shoot magazine. I always bought shoot and match at that time. And the middle pages of the shoot was overhead kick, and it had Mo Johnson, Celtic, and Scotland. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Oh, because they reprinted the picture weeks later. Yeah, and it was at that time where we thought we'd sign them. Oh, so so brutal to 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 see that. But um, but yeah. So anyway, go back to the, the DF. They they. They asked me to come and work for them. After me emailing them in 2009, asking them for a job to be told, you know, send us your CV, we'll keep it on file, blah, blah, blah. And then they they saw the work I did at Electric Circus, knew that I was a music nut and that I was prepared to, you know, put everything into it and work my fingers to the bone. And then the next thing, I, I got a job at King Tut's. So I'm now, this is what I do now. I work at King Tut's. I advance all the shows. I'm in charge of the, the reps there and... I rep all the show. We had the Killers a couple of weeks ago. It was absolutely mental. Killers played Transmit, and then they came up and played a midnight show at King Tut's. So I'm at the back door waiting on a police-escorted Killers arriving at the back door, and then, like, next thing, Brandon Flowers just walking by going, hey, how's it going? I'm like, cool. And they were, like, really buzzing, having just played Transmit. Headlight Transmit. And it was so weird to see a band after they just played... You don't normally get access to a band after they've just headlined a festival. Mm-hmm. But they were came in, they were just like to Dave McGeekin, the promoter, who they've worked with since the very start at Tuts. They were just like, oh my God, such a great show, probably one of my favourite ever shows. And Geech is like, oh, makes me happy, Brandon. Makes me happy, thanks. Geech is a big Greenock Morton fan, by the way. He's, he's a huge Greenock Morton fan. Um, but it uh, winds me up about that League Cup win at Celtic Park mm-hmm. all the time. You know, 23rd <laughs> of September 2013, I think it is. You know, you know the one Alan I'm talking Moore about. Alan Moore was a gaffer. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, aye, winds me up about that. Dougie Emery. Dougie Emery, aye. Yeah, winds me up about that all the time. Just on, that, on the subject of Tuts, I went to see the stairs mm-hmm. there. Was mm-hmm. it last year? year before last? 
and it was like a skeleton key records. Um, there was maybe the Sundowners, the Stairs, I think the three bands. Oh, uh, it was Rituals not playing as well. You're right, aye. There That's used right. to be the Merrilies. And the Rituals were playing. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't been in King Tut's for ages. Mm-hmm. Now, I might have imagined this. There used to be a wonder wall in the toilet, didn't there? On the urinal. Uh, that was paid for by Noel Gallagher. And it was it was basically it said wonder wall on the urinal. Oh, really? Oh, I know that they've got like a Hunter S. Thompson coat now on the, mm-hmm. on the urinal. Um, it escapes me what the actual coat is, but it's something about the music industry and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know about the wonder wall thing. I need to find that I'm out. I'm imagining this wonder wall. It was a urinal and it had in the the Decca Oasis style oh, wonder right. wall right across it. I mean, it's very possible. I mean, it's, but it wasn't it's, there when I obviously went to see the stairs. So. I'd, oh well, I'll, I'll find out about that for you. But uh, they, because Davy the Wolf, the venue manager, he'll know he's he's in with the bricks there. Mm-hmm. And if wolf. not, yeah, he gets called the Wolf. <laughs> he's a big Celtic fan as well, actually. Um, but Liam came back recently. I don't know if you know about that. Like Liam, so Shane Meadows. Uh, we, we filmed a video. Yeah, yeah. Liam was. Um, he was, you know, uh, sort of brainstorming about what he was going to do for a video, and he met. He really liked Shane Meadows' uh, Stone Roses film, Is it made of stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, he got in touch with them, and they met up, and they had a few drinks, and then Shane was like, "So the single's called Come Back to Me." He's like. We should go back to a sort of venue that means something to you. And Liam straight away just went King Tut's, Glasgow. I've not been there for however many years since they did an after show after the Barrowland gig, which I was actually at the 2001 10 Years of Noise and Confusion tour when they did two nights. Life. And they were both on Sky. Aye, yeah. Right. And uh, Johnny Mar came, Johnny Mar Johnny came Mar- on, played well, Champagne Supernova. It was a Saturday night. Because that was a night, that was the time when Sky put Scottish football on at six o'clock on a Saturday night, and we bet Motherwell. And <laughs> That's brilliant, Stato facts. I know. Lubo Maravchik scored a fantastic free kick, and we wore the white away top. When did he not score a fantastic free kick? <laughs> I, I watched it in Beards. Oh, did you? Then, that, oh, before the gig? Before the gig. Before, oh, yeah. Amazing. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't uh, Gallagher not dedicate one of the songs to Alan McCoy? He did. He did. This is for Ali McCoy. I, I, I've got the, I've got the that recording. That was a Patsy Kensett reference, wasn't it? It was, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Neil Lennon was at that gig. Me and my mate Nick went up to Neil Lennon at the end. We were like, oh, Neil, great to meet you and all that. And he was just like, all right, lads. And, and then, he, then he went away. And then this guy came up and went, you used to are, oh, this and that. He's like, I've been waiting here for half an hour trying to get his attention. You used to just go up and speak to him straight away. And he was raging at us for us having stolen his time with Neil Lennon. And we were just like, well, we just seen him and said, all right. To him. What I remember about that way is his gig. Was you mentioned earlier that the Barrowlands holds nineteen hundred? Mm-hmm. There was no way nineteen hundred people in the Barrowlands that night. I reckon there was only about maybe eleven hundred, twelve hundred. Oh really? Uh, the, because of the because, filming part. Because of the filming part, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah, I, I know that they definitely reduced the capacity for the Depeche Mode gig. Uh, was it last year? Last or the year, year before? at the BBC Six, Six Music. Music. Mm-hmm. That, it wasn't. It wasn't completely sold out at that. Like they deliberately reduced the capacity because of. I think they probably uh, done it with the Mary Chain and Ride on the Friday night as well. When yeah. I was there, because there was plenty of space. Oh, what a gig that must that have been. That was good. I didn't yeah. go to that, but yeah. Um, the, Mary, the Mary Chain weren't as good as when they were at the Barrowlands themselves when they done Psycho Candy. Yeah. Was oh, like, they did the Psycho Candy tour, didn't they? Aye, that was fantastic. It's a band that I've came to quite late, the Mary Chain. I've never, I, I, obviously, around about the time they were really, really uh, prevalent, I, I, I was not listening to the Jesus and Mary Chain, no. but Andy from the Twilight Sad's a massive fan, and he's just tell like... Can guitar Ah, he's just like, ah, you need to listen to the Mary Chain, Pavel. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but what were we talking about? Liam? It, it's funny you should mention Las Vegas as well. Mm-hmm. When they got kind of big, mm-hmm. the the change in sound that they went through was obviously Alan McGee. Mm-hmm. And we met them at the, a venue that was down on the riverside in Glasgow. I'm going to say the 13th note, but it was not the 13th Barfly. note. Barfly. Barfly. And my cousin's slightly older than me. And the, James Allen was talking all night to my cousin about uh, the Jesus and Mary chain. Oh, aye. That, that's all. That's all they kept on going on Love about. Love some, aye, yeah. Now I got to know Glass Vegas early on. I went to see a band called Tiny Dancers at Cabaret Voltaire, and Glass Vegas were a support. And I'm not. I'm not joking. There was twenty people there watching Glass Vegas, and they came out and they did their. There was way more kind of doo woppy. Mm-hmm. Like Rab had the gingham shirt on, and Paul had the three D shades. Did he have the Elvis microphone? He did have the Elvis microphone. I've got really ropey footage of. Um, 
Legs and Show and Daddy's Gone on my YouTube channel. Like, mm. it's terrible. It's like a Nokia N95, like, pixelated as hell. But um, it is from that night. And I went up to them afterwards and went, all oh, right, I, I write for a magazine. They were all in black, all looking really cool. And I was kind of nervous going up to them. But Denise, uh, James's sister, was really sound. And I had a good chat with them. And then she was like, oh, send, will you send me the review and you've done it. So I sent her the review. And in the review I said about Go Square Go, I was like, if this isn't heard en masse in the Barrowland within the next year or two, then, I don't know, the music industry's fucked or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember vividly standing in the Barrowland and just Go Square Go happened and I was like, I wrote that and this is happening, this is mental. And then one day I was walking at my flat one afternoon and I got a call from Sony, or it was either Sony Columbia or Columbia, um, and it was this guy Chris and he was like, all right, all right, John Paul, um, we heard that your your friends with Las Vegas and uh you know, we're just trying to like we're trying to sort of dampen down the hype a bit about the band. And I was like, What do you mean they went? It's just this it's getting out of control, you know, NME front cover and all that kind of stuff. He was like, We want to kinda of localise it a bit more and we know you write for this magazine. Would you go on the road with the band just in these shows that are coming up and just kind of write like a tour diary type thing? And I was like, I I'll do that. Okay. So they did shows in Ocean's nightclub in Kirkcaldy which is, I don't know if you know if it's still there or not, but it's this big nightclub that had a tiny wee stage and they played Fubar down the road. That's right, I think. And, and I was at both of those shows with them as their I part was, of their crew. I was at the Fubar. Were you at the Fubar one? Eh? <laughs> and, uh, and then they finished up at ABC2 where they recorded it and that's the second disc on the special edition of the debut record is, is a live... The, f- the Fubar show, they dedicated Be My Baby to my cousin's wife. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Amazing. Oh, that's cool. Did you get a kebab from Mabra Kebabra outside? I didn't eat kebabs. Like, uh-huh. I think I did. I think I did. <laughs> I remember telling somebody that I'd been at Abra Kebabra. Yeah, yeah. You don't um, forget it. I, so, no, like, so it was great to sort of see. I mean, James is a massive Celtic fan as well. He's played for Celtic uh, uh, on Celtic Park. He's been, and on, he's been on a Celtic state of mind. Oh, so he has. I've heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, of course.
<laughs> I have also played at Celtic Park uh, at a football aid game, scored a hat trick. It was, you know, it was like a dream. Paid like maybe two hundred pounds, and it was like you raise money for charity, mm-hmm. and I paid. I ended up paying about one hundred and twenty quid of my own money, and then the rest I raised uh, through through sponsorship. But um, yeah, I came on only the second half, and my mate was up front and was tiring, and he was like, "Listen, I'll just hold it up for you, and you can make runs through the middle." So, <laughs> ten minutes into the second half, I start running through the middle when I'm shooting into the goals that Larson scored the chip. And I'm just like p- played clean through, and I was like, "Oh my god, I can score here!" <laughs> I scored. I just ran off and did a slight a slide, and you could, I've got the DVD of it. And you can hear me screaming, just going mental. <laughs> and then I I won a I nicked the ball off Danny McGrain. Was he I, the coach? Was he coaching the team? Joe Miller was in our team, and he was our coach. And right. Danny McGrain was the player coach in the other team. And Danny McGrain kind of dithered with him. He was the best player in the park, by the way. But he dithered on the ball, and I got the ball off him. Ran in their centre half brought me down for a penalty, so I took the penalty, and then the third one was another through like run through and beating the keeper. So you ever scored at Celtic Park, Paul? Paul Cuddy? I have never scored at Celtic Park, so I'm very envious. Um, it was it was so surreal. Like I was like, what is going on here? It was it was a completely out of body experience. Did you think about how you would celebrate? Prior to the game, no, no, because I, I was, I was like, I'll not score. I'm playing centre midfield. There's no way. Like when you start running from the halfway line with the ball, it's a long way. Mm. Like it's a long way. Like I mean, when I, you see the pitch mm-hmm. on that point, you think to yourself, how did Caldwell or or Stubbs, how did they manage to spread the ball all over? Because it's huge when you see it yeah. from trackside. How would you celebrate your your goal, Kevin? Um, I've never actually thought about that. What I actually have thought about though was when I won the Paradise one fall. I'm you, definitely you, when you win it. When or? I win it, right? I'm definitely taking a ball off a sub and batter and at the back of the net. Aye, I would think so. Aye, yeah. No, I just I, I remember two guys from my class at school won it. Um, well, one of them did, but the other one just went down because the two of them were steaming. It was uh, Paul Rennie and um, Michael uh, Michael Riley, Mick Riley. And I saw them down in the pitch, and I was like, so I could tell that these, these, whoever these two guys were, they were drunk, obviously. And then I looked up on the screen, and I was like, oh my god, that's Paul Rennie. This is like late nineties, early noughties, or whatever it was. I don't know, maybe two thousand and two, something like that. And uh, next thing, uh, Paul Rennie goes and pretends to take a penalty, and then like goes like that in the penalty spot, runs away from the presentation, pretends to take a penalty, waits for it to like not go in or like imaginary going in and then runs around doing the George Cadetti celebration <laughs> and I was like that's what I'd do I would definitely milk it you know I mean never going to do it again probably so so how did you celebrate? Uh, I I dived along I did the Klinsman dive because it was quite it was quite dewy so like I, there was a bit of slide so I did the Klinsman dive and then uh, I didn't get Mason on the back of my top I got my granddad's surname Sibulski just because I couldn't get Mason in the back of a Celtic top. Because they, they made you a strip. And, and I was like, I'm not getting Mason on the back of a top. No offence, Dad, but, you know, you gave me this affliction with this name. So I got Sibulski in the back, so I, I did the point to this guy, to my granddad. Brilliant. Um, so I, that was, you know, that was that was quite nice. But the, the, the Billy McNeil story about my name, if you want to hear that, um, my mate Michael phoned Billy McNeil's bar. I think it was around about... Ni- <laughs> I think it was the cup final where we got beat and Rod Wallace scored. Do you remember? One nil. I think Rangers won the treble. Under Advocat, maybe? Would that be right? I think. It would have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he phoned the pub beforehand, obviously pre internet, kind of pre widespread mobile phones, and he phoned the pub and Billy McNeil was behind the bar. So I got like, I had a pint served to me by Billy McNeil, which is still one of the most surreal things ever, is like. He's serving. I'm like, I should be serving you. I actually said it. I should be serving you, and he went, "Oh nonsense! It's my pub. What do you want, son?" And I was like, "Pint of lager, <laughs> please, Billy." <laughs> and then uh, the phone he came out with the phone, and it was one of those ones with the the cord that you pull up, you know, the proper nineties phone. And he was like, "Is there a John Paul Mason in here?" Right, and everyone just started gutting themselves, and all the folk in my supporters club were all like, "Who's the Mason in the green?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh no!" And I walk up to Billy McNeil, and he just he put his hand on my shoulder, and he went, "No luck, pal." <laughs> and I was like, 
And then I was like, Michael, uh, that was Billy McNeil that just gave you the phone. Thanks for that. And he was like, I've got you a ticket for the vinyl. I was like, I've got you a ticket for the Ardross and Gary Owen, his, his bus. And I was like, cool. <laughs> that, that, that means you're all right then. That's, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the slag in for getting a ticket, so it's fine. You were telling us earlier about Liam. What, did you have the opportunity to meet him and Shane on that video yeah, shoot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Liam thing... Um, it, it was it was very kind of all like I mean we, I started at like seven in the morning that day because all the, the the film crew came early and Shane Meadows came early as well and uh, yeah he, he um he he didn't he was supposed to come I think at like half three or four o'clock but then all of a sudden heard through the radios Liam's coming he's coming now he's just he just turned up and he didn't come the back way which is where everybody had planned for him to come he came the front way so there's like people outside and all that and he's just like strolling down St Vincent Street like to walk in the front door but it was all part of the plan Shane wanted to have film film footage of him walking in in fact they actually did it again just, uh, yeah Transmit. they did it again just so that he could uh, he asked him to do something else anyway so he comes in and I'm like oh my god walk down the stairs and I walk down the sort of backstage area stairs into the bar and Liam just walks into the venue you know like, 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 as just as you'd expect them to do with that kind of like, you know, have it, you know, like kind of just looking around, going yeah, yeah. And then he walked into the venue, wandered around, and just like shook a few hands, and then he came up to the uh, he came up to the office, uh, to the the changing room, dressing room even. And uh, I'm like sitting there in my production office, going Liam Gallagher is in the dressing room right now, having a laugh and all that with the band and everything. And then uh, this wee guy came in that was a friend of the tour manager. His tour manager Scottish, he's from Glasgow. Uh, ben and Ben's girlfriend's pal's son. They'd brought him from school and not told him what he was going to do. Like they'd, he's a massive Oasis fan. Like he's got the the Stone Island jacket on and all that, and the 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 silk scarf. You know this sort of paisley scarf. And this wee guy's like no idea what's happening. And then the next thing they bring Liam in to like my production office, and he's there, and his just face is just like, oh my. He's like, all right, kid. He's like. You're not supposed to be at school, uh, and the wee guy's like, uh, 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 and he's like, you should stay, you could stick in at school, mate. And he's just like, never mind this nonsense, this singing malak or something like that. And then, he, and then the wee guy was just like, oh my god, <laughs> the wee guy was maybe like ten or eleven or something like that. And he went, we're getting this photograph or what? And then the wee guy was just like, photo with Liam, and he's just like, nice one. And then I was like, uh, Liam, uh, just wanted to say pleasure to have you in the venue. And he was just like, all right. I was like, my name's John Paul. Um, but it's John Paul hyphenated unlike yours and he was just like oh yeah I like how you know that and then I, and then I was like um, I got, I brought I brought you something and I brought him an original 7 inch of John Lennon's Power of the People from my dad's collection colour colour 7 inch with Lennon in the front and Yoko in the back and I was like you've probably got this and if you have you know it's cool but I, I know that it would mean more to you than it does to me and uh, you go and he, he stood looking at it and he was like you know I don't know if I do have it he flipped it around and he was like, fucking hell. And he was like, but if I do, if, 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 I, if I do have it, I've got two now and one of them's from you, so give me some skin. <laughs> and then like, we shook hands and went, and then into this kind of like handshake and I was like, okay, cool, I can, I can that, that's it, I can retire now. <laughs> this is amazing. And then he came, he, he went on the stage and he did the, he did the four songs and he was like to the crowd, he was just like, he's like, the scene of the crime, the scene of the crime and everyone was going mental and I'm side the stage just going, what is happening? You played like rock and roll star first song. Just like wow, amazing! And all the all the people in the crowd were like kind of competition winners or whatever. So they were just go mental, and then ah uh, oh, yeah, he, he had a good time.
mentioned earlier Frightened Rabbits, Twilight mm-hmm. Sad, We Are Jetpacks. Mm-hmm. Obviously there's quite a vibrant Scottish music scene where all the bands seem to give each other a, d- a dig out. In yeah, that. yeah. I think there was nothing more where this was highlighted and recently with the, the tragic passing of Scott. Mm-hmm. You've been booking bands for a wee while. You see touring bands. Um, there seems to be more and more of a campaign for musicians' mental health mm-hmm. and for things to get done about musicians' yeah, mental health. Totally. Have you seen a change in bands? I mean, obviously, I've been I've been to see bands in broadcast and stuff like mm-hmm. that, and bands for America who are playing in broadcast for I don't know how much money they're getting, but they're but they're asking people on Twitter, "Can you put us up for the night?" Because we're going to the airport the following oh, day, yeah. and and it's not a a very attractive, glamorous lifestyle at that level. No, it's not. <laughs> I've 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 lived through that lifestyle and uh, just being like the wee guy on tour with a band, like doing merch for them or whatever. I mean, that's that's how I got to know the Twilight Sad really well. Was was going on tour with them and and Frightened Rabbit as well, mm-hmm. and um, and that's what I, I mean. I now manage, co-manage the Twilight Sad with my friend Ray. Um, and that I kind of got brought in on that just because I was close to the band and and because I'd done a lot of the sort of the, the dirty work if you mm-hmm. want to call it that just like helping them out with loading load ins and outs and venues and all the rest of it. But yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of bands' attitudes towards towards mental health, or um, one of, one of the big things is um, Andy Ingalls. Uh, I know Andy. You know Andy mm-hmm. um, used to manage Will Doyle. From East India Youth, Youth. Yeah, great, great artist. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things that I, I read a lot of his articles. Mm-hmm. I saw East India Youth at King Tut's. He, he was I fantastic. was there. I he repped was, the show. Yeah, he was, was fantastic great. that yeah. night. What he says was, he says you've got artists who have got mental health problems, and it's acceptable in the industry to give them drinking drugs. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, on, on a rider, they come in and go, "Well, what do you want to drink?" I, I think, I think having access to to. I mean, we were we were very fortunate. The Twilight Sad supported the Cure um, two years ago, which was absolutely mental. I mean, like these Mogwai in your T-shirt, they're the kind of reason why that happened. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, Stuart from Mogwai emailed Robert Smith and said, "Oh, there's this band called the Twilight Sad. I think you'd be into them." And then uh, Robert Smith came back going, "Oh, I've got their first two albums already. I love mm-hmm. them." And then Stuart was like, "Oh, well, here, meet Andy." And then he introed Andy, and then Andy and Robert Smith had this sort of, you know, mutual respect email relationship for a good few years, and it was always the kind of pipe dream we would say, oh, you know, when we get the Cure tour and all that, and then one day we actually got the email from Robert Smith to say we're touring next year. Do you want to open in North America and Canada? And we were, I remember getting it in the office at Tuts, and I was just like, straight away to my boss James, I was like. I'm going to need to be away next year for a wee bit. <laughs> Don't need paid. I <laughs> just need to be away. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, we've got to go to like Hollywood Bowl and, you know, Madison Square Garden. It was just, it was absolutely mental, like completely mental. But um, what was I going to say? The riders. The ri- oh, right. Oh, I mean, we were, we were exposed to ridiculous riders on that tour. And, you know, if you'd wanted to, you could have just got drunk all day, which is not the point. You know, it's, it's kind of like you need to maintain a level of professionalism and, and, you know, it's not it's not good if you're constantly drinking. <laughs> it's going to affect your show and all the rest of it. So I think I think yeah, I think people since since what happened with Scott, I think there's definitely been a level of awareness that I've not previously been uh, privy to in terms of like people kind of looking out for each other a bit more and just being more cautious and more respectful and I, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard to explain, it's, it's, but I, it's definitely prevalent and I can see that it's happened. Look, the Twilight Sad their lyrics are very intense and, and very emotional mm-hmm. and I think that's so we're frightened rabbits 
Um, Scots lyrics were sometimes not uncomfortable to listen to, but if you were going through certain problems, you could, Scott uh, articulated it very well at, at, yeah. at times. Eh? And spent, if we go back to the Twilight Sad, their last album really took off. But we spoke just before here, they played here, mm-hmm. uh, just after the... Would it have been their second album? Would it have been? I think they played the yeah. I think they played here on Forget the Night Ahead, but pr- and definitely on No One Can Ever Know because that was twenty twelve, and I remember it happening. I remember a gig being here in twenty twelve because um, it was around about the time they played Grand Old Opry in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. You know that mad western place. You ever been there? <laughs> I, saw, I saw Las Vegas. Hi. So. Oh yeah, I know that. And you did play there. It's it's quite bizarre the Grand Old Opry, and has certain shady uh, undertones with the confederate flag and all that kind of stuff like they do like a a mad like salute and all that mm-hmm. to the confederate flag it's quite odd but you know it exists um, but yeah so, so the pressure's on a band mm-hmm. at that point they're not making a lot of money because the music industry's now changed mm-hmm. completely um, that did you see the Rip It Up documentary during the week there? I watched when, it last night. When they were talking about yeah. the amount of money in the 90s mm-hmm. that bands, late 80s, early 90s, that bands were, were thrown at them. Mm-hmm. Do you see a change in bands now when they come? Because the, that money's not there. Nobody's buying records. Basically, they need to tour now to make money. They need to sell merch well, everything, to make money. Everything is in touring nowadays. I mean, there's if, if you can establish a, a, a fan base... And they and they come and see you regularly when you tour and when you go and tour then that and and they also buy your merch and that it's it's absolutely crucial to your life your life blood as a band because mm-hmm. you're not going to really get it from album sales. I mean you you'll get an extent of sales you know if if you if you release something that's that's limited or whatever you know like the Twilight Sad have got really really passionate fans who will buy you know if it's like a a, a, a 10 inch or you know or something packaged in a different way they'll want to have it I mean I, I'm very much a, a, a person that likes physical things like I, I, I don't download albums and I, I don't think I ever will um, I, I hope that there's still people like me that are younger than me because mm-hmm. otherwise we're in trouble um, but yeah I think uh, I think nowadays the young bands that you see coming through they're all about um, figures and streaming figures and mm-hmm. followers on Instagram and followers and on Twitter and everything else and sometimes I think you need to leave that be and that that will come if you're if you're writing good songs but you know just just worry about your gigs and playing music and playing so, music yeah. Yeah, and it's, I think a lot of the bands get exposure very quickly because of social media mm-hmm. and I think there's a lot of pressure put on bands. Uh, very quickly oh. because, because of the social media which then feeds into their mental state mm-hmm. that there's a constant pressure there's constant we need to keep on one of the things that Andy kept on going on about was the fact that you had to do social media posts every day mm-hmm. and it was very very tiresome tiresome <laughs> on, on the artist to actually keep on doing this and mm-hmm. doing this and record companies don't really understand mm. yeah. the pressure that they're putting very on demanding. I mean creative people there's probably a fine line in their head. They've, they've got to have that bit of no madness, but it's, it's bare in your soul, really. Uh, I mean, you're kind of exposing yourself a lot more, especially online. You know, if uh, you know, there's no hiding place really. If you if you put something out yeah. online, then, it, then that's it. You know, and putting out um, stuff on Twitter and all the rest of it is kind of like I've, no... I've never used Twitter like that. But then I'm not I'm not a creative person so I don't know how people like that think so I've never used Twitter really to sort of be like oh this is how I'm feeling you know etc I just kind of I don't know I I, I listen I listen to your stuff <laughs> I, I, I honestly pretty much listen to, to listen and look at Celtic stuff on Twitter almost exclusively <laughs> band stuff kind of uh, I take it or leave it <laughs> the, the, another interesting thing it's funny how these things all kind of come back round to the same point like what you've just mentioned there Celtic and um, I think it was about a month ago, I was in Dunfermline Glen at a first birthday party. Mm-hmm. And there was two girls there who were friendly with my wife who were at my school, two twins. So I'm just chatting away, shooting the breeze with these two girls who have both got wee kids. Um, and I was like, oh, how's your brother Jamie? I was in the same year as Jamie. And blah, blah, blah. And what about your other brother Brendan? Ah, he plays in a band. All right, thinking it'll be some, you know, unsigned act in Dunfermline or a side. What's the name of the band? The Twilight Sad. 
So I was right on to Twitter, back to you, because we'd set this interview up yeah. and I thought, you obviously know Brendan. Oh, so what, yes, I know Brendan very well. And he, he plays keys he, for the Twilight Zone. Yeah, I, I um the the subject of a lot of uh, <laughs> Brendan likes to poke fun at me shall we say um, and, and no, none more so than uh, when I was do you remember the Maribor game um, when we got beat off Maribor right so at the end of that game the sky cameras obviously do their thing where they zoom in on folk and all that of course, I get a text maybe half an hour were you that it. guy just sitting on a solitary seat were you that one? that was me you, you know about that. It, it became a meme. Well, and it became a meme in my world anyway. And and so about in half an hour, an hour after the game, I got a call or a text from my mate Sean, and he was like, Are "You at the game tonight?" And I was like, "Of course I was at the game. It's a Champions League qualifier at Celtic Park. Of course I was there." And he was like, "Yeah, I know." And I went, "How?" And he went, "You were on the telly." And I was like, "Oh no." And then the next thing, it just started popping up on Facebook. Folk, folk taking pictures, selfies with me on the screen and like then taking a picture, like pointing at me. And then the Photoshop started and I started getting Photoshopped into like mad situations like behind Cheryl Cole's curtain like <laughs> and uh, sitting next to the, at the swimming pool with Jay-Z and Beyonce jumping in and I'm sitting at the side of the pool just with my, my head in my hands. And the only reason I, st- I sat there for a it looks like the stadium's empty. There was still people there, but I sat and I watched the Maribor players celebrate because I do this sort of masochistic thing where I like watch like horror. Like I, I, I remember watching Rangers doing the huddle when they won the league at Celtic Park, and I was like, I'm remembering that. Mm-hmm. I'm remembering that, and I'm saving that for the good times because the good times will feel a lot better. I do that. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I it's it's that. quite a weird thing to do. I know to put yourself through that. A lot of people just go, Ugh, I'm away. You know, just you know, fling their seat up and they just leave, or they leave before the the, the horror starts. Whereas I watch it and I watch the Maribor players playing, and that's when the camera zoomed in on me as I'm sitting watching these Maribor guys just having the time of their lives in their park. Old Brendan keeps reminding you about that. Brilliant. Thanks very much. You've scored the goal at Celtic Park. You've shook the hand of Liam Gallagher, and now you've been on a Celtic stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's for the hat trick. That's the hat trick right there. <laughs> Perfect hat trick. Cheers. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Pleasure. That was excellent.